So I'm here to talk about uh, an interesting area. Um, we are, uh, at my company, we're very concerned about how we can apply decentralized technologies uh, to reducing surveillance um, and censorship. So I did, I've been traveling quite a bit recently. Uh, I just went around the world for the last two weeks, spent a bunch of time in China. Um, and this photo is actually taken on the left um, in Shoreditch in London. Uh, in the UK, we have, I think it's more closed circuit TV cameras per person than any other country in the world. Um, and this is in a place that's supposed to be a bastion of freedom. Um, there's a quote here on the right-hand side from a book uh, called On Tyranny, and I absolutely recommend you. It's a short read, but it really um, sets out some basic principles of how to resist totalitarianism. Um, there's another kind of censorship that we're not always aware of, which is some people call this fake news, but it's the idea of censoring things in a way that seems OK, but actually is completely false. Ai Weiwei is a famous artist in China. And he, um, this sculpture here is made out of bicycles. It's very tall. Uh, this is in the uh, Royal Academy in London. And the actual meaning about this sculpture is very much about um, a revolutionary piece about how bicycles are used heavily in China and really the idea of moving forwards in a society. Um, but instead, there's this very vanilla piece that's approved by the People's Republic of China, which is that he likes to ride bicycles. So there's lots of forms of kind of subtle censorship and uh, more overt censorship. <clears throat> I read a lot of sci-fi. I'm actually writing a, a sci-fi novel in my spare time. Um, a, a very influential book for me recently was uh, The Three-Body Problem. This is actually written in China. It's a Chinese author. Um, and it's managed to stay in China and, and be quite successful there. Uh, and if you read this book, it talks about a, an alien race that has no ability to censor their thoughts. Literally, they transmit their thoughts through electromagnetic waves. And then over time, they have completely much more advanced technology than anyone else in, in, in the world. And so the people in the world think they're screwed. But it turns out that the one thing that humans can do is not, they can filter their thoughts. They can decide you know, what they're going to broadcast to people. Um, the Circle, uh, 984 is obviously very, very well understood, but The Circle is also a, a great book talking about how a corporation becomes the totalitarian control versus the, uh, versus the state. So I think it's an interesting point to think about there. I'm going to give a really quick tour through encryption and uh, a little bit about surveillance. Um, people have been trying to censor or encrypt what they say for a long time. Uh, back in 50 BC, uh, the history of uh, the Caesar cipher, um, essentially a very simple rotational cipher uh, that unless you know the particular seed to get the cipher to work, you can't figure out what the person is transmitting. It's really easy to crack with a computer, but a little bit more difficult with paper. Um, in the 1940s, uh, really a pivotal point in the, in the Second World War was um, the development technologies to crack the Enigma machine, which is being used by the Germans to encrypt its transmissions. Um, Alan Turing, obviously a very uh, influential person here, not just in this, but also in the history of computers. Um, the interesting part of this, actually, was not so much the, the way it was cracked, but the fact that the, uh, the, the ability to read these messages became an issue such that it was not clear how much action should be taken when it was clear that the Germans were about to attack a certain area. So there was kind of like an information theory aspect that had to be figured out there. Uh, back in 89, I got my first email address as an uh, undergraduate student at Cambridge. And um, this is how you accessed email, pretty much. Um, but the interesting thing about this is it was fundamentally decentralized. You could run an email server, you still can, in your house. And it would be you know, steve at myserver.com. Since then, we've really centralized it. And another thing we missed out on is encryption. So back in 91, Phil Zimmerman wrote an interesting uh, piece of code called PGP. So it stood for pretty good privacy. Um, PGP was actually classified as a weapon, as munitions, by the US government. And he was 
he was charged. He was actually almost put in jail at one point. Um, we're not quite there still, although there's, if you go to get into Bitcoin and so on, there's people almost going to go to jail for some of these things or have. We get all the way to 2013, and this was shocking to many people, um, but um, just really opened a lot of people's eyes. Uh, you know, whether you agree with his methods or not, um, I think that the information that Snowden exposed has, has really changed a lot of the conversation. Um, it was certainly one of the motivating factors uh, in my team's desire to create something which was able to resist surveillance. There is surveillance everywhere. Uh, I just spent a few weeks in China. Um, I was unable to access Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, any major sites that the West is used to using. I believe China is getting ready to just cut the hard lines. So it'll just be Baidu, WeChat, Tencent. They'll have hard lines to the internet. Everybody else will just have nothing. And China is just fine. Architecture tends to be an interesting aspect, a way to create societies. The Panopticon is a, a prison that was designed in the late, 19, late 1800s um, that was essentially every single person was able to be watched by the, uh, by the guards without the awareness of being watched. So it's like the little weird sort of picture here. It's a piece of modern art showing how everyone's under surveillance. It's kind of weird, right? Uh, so moving from decentralized to centralized, ARPANET, which was the beginnings of the internet, was initially fundamentally a fully decentralized architecture. It was actually designed to withstand a nuclear attack. Right now, if you just take out Google, data centers, you'll be good. Not that I'm suggesting you do that. Um, we now have very much more centralized architectures, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn. As my example showed in China, it was not just that the firewall was filtering me, but was, I was very dependent, I still am, on a couple of different services. Back in 99, um, which I, I first got into peer-to-peer, -peer, I was very influenced by what was happening with Napster. Um, Napster was actually easy to shut down because it was a centralized directory server, which if you targeted that, you could shut it down, and the, the, uh, the music guys did. Um, and then it came back later. Uh, BitTorrent was much more difficult to shut down, and Bramco and the inventor of BitTorrent is actually now developing a, a technology for Bitcoin. Um, then we get Bitcoin in 2008, really the beginning of peer-to-peer -peer money. And I think it's touching 10,000 or 9,000 or 11,000 today. And then Ethereum, which is even more interesting in terms of being a decentralized computer. I'm going to leave you with a couple of things here. Uh, this is a speech from uh, the great dictator, Charlie Chaplin. Um, if you come tonight and watch me DJ, I actually have a really cool mix with him uh, speaking on top of it. Um, this is you know, from the Second World War. And it's fascinating to me that a lot of the lessons, maybe it's kind of a generational thing, a lot of the lessons we're still having to learn. I have to revisit these ideas of what it means to create totalitarian states. Um, I believe that technology can give us a solution here, as it can to many things. But it can also give us the opposite. It could give us essentially either a the ability to control society or the ability to free society. And it's, it's pretty much a choice there. A lot of it depends on how you architect these things. A uh, little pitch for uh, our project. Um, back in May, I started this project uh, called ORCID. And we are essentially uh, rebuilding some, um, some older technologies, uh, essentially reimagining the way that anonymous communication can be had over the internet. Um, the way our architecture works is we have a series of nodes that when you want to access information, you go through a series of these nodes. Each of those nodes is getting paid in a cryptocurrency that we've developed. Um, the exit node goes and picks up the piece of content, whether it's BBC, Facebook, Twitter, wraps it, and then sends it back along the same chain such that you're able to view that in wherever you are. So our goal is essentially is to open up the entire internet to everyone. So China is obviously a big example of that, but I'm very concerned about the Middle East. Um, and just surveillance and censorship everywhere, I think, is very important for us to think about. I have a habit of finishing my, uh, my talks early, so I guess I've got two minutes left. Um, these are my coordinates if you want to get in touch. Uh, I'm giving a few other talks today. And, and as I said, I'll be out at the Loilu place tonight. But thank you very much.